We've been talking about the Takashi 69 racketeering case a lot recently. People have asked about my own racketeering case and to get into some more details. So what I've done is I've dug up legal paperwork from my case, found some of this under my bed. And I'll read to you and comment on the situation I was in. Right. Page 12. The Atwood Enterprise used for the purpose of, of facilitating a racketeering enterprise, engaging in the importation, sale, and distribution of ecstasy. And now it lists the offenses that the detectives were looking to put on members of the Atwood Enterprise. Participating in a criminal syndicate, possession of dangerous drugs for sale to wit ecstasy, Transport for sale, import into the state, offer to transport for sale, sell, transfer, offer to sell or transfer a dangerous drug to ecstasy. Illegal control of an enterprise, illegally conducting an enterprise, money laundering, conspiracy to do any of the enumerated offenses. The goals of the detectives were to intercept and request to obtain information concerning the following, the scope and extent of the racketeering enterprise, the identification of members of the drug components of the racketeering enterprise. So what they do is, like I've said in the Takashi videos, everyone gets a letter in order of importance within the racketeering enterprise. The identification of members of the money laundering components of the racketeering enterprise. The current sources of suppliers, importers, manufacturers of ecstasy, storage locations and facilities, identity of distributors and sellers, prices paid in acquisition, the extent to which the proceeds from the sales are involved in financing the racketeering enterprise or to acquire properties and how it's laundered. So basically, that's how the authorities structure the charges. If you're facing RICO or at the state level, it's not called RICO, it's, it's racketeering, continuous criminal enterprise, but it's the same situation as what Takashi's got I was in through, through this. Right, so within the legal paperwork now I've found where the police have actually intercepted some calls and I'll, I'll say what, what the police say in these documents, but I told everybody who worked for me never ever sp speak about a major drug deal on the phone. If anyone wanted to ever speak to me about anything, I always said, see me in person. I'm just not going to speak on the phone. But people don't listen. They get carried away. It was the New Mexican Mafia that taught me that. So... April 19th, 2002, outbound call to 312-337-7173. This is me calling my friend Tucson Charlie. Tucson Charlie is no longer with us. He put a gun in his mouth and blew his head off. So I can talk about this. It's not going to get him in trouble. Sean calls Charlie, asks Charlie if he had fun in the pen. Charlie got some prison time on an unrelated case. Charlie talks about how he got arrested in LA on two occasions. He tells Sean he wants to come to Arizona in a couple of weeks. Sean tells him to stop by when he comes out and asks Charlie what he's been doing. Charlie says he was trying to be good, but he still has to make money. He tells Sean that a real job was not going to cut it. He still had to make money and do a little something on the side. Sean replies, very dangerous times we live in. I'm trying to give Charlie a heads up here not to say anything on the phone. Charlie goes on to tell Sean that he got four years for some fucking weed. Tells Sean he's been working that county for five years and they finally caught him. So when they did, they had to make three pounds stick. Sean tells Charlie to call when he comes to Arizona. They can talk in person. Charlie says they need to sit down and discuss a bunch of things. Now here is the police's interpretation of the call. Your affiants believe that Charlie is talking to Sean about coming to Arizona in order to purchase illegal drugs. He's telling Sean about being arrested for marijuana and was in jail. 
Charlie discusses that he wants a legitimate job but needs to sell drugs on the side for additional money. Charlie tells Sean he wants to meet and talk about a bunch of things, which we believe is regarding illegal drugs. Sean tells Charlie they will talk in person when he comes to Arizona. Your affiants believe Charlie wants to discuss illegal drug business, a bunch of things with Sean, and Sean does not want to talk about it on the phone. Don't ever talk about anything on the phone. They can retrieve it all. This is consistent with information your affiants have learned about Sean during interception of communications. He does not like to discuss illegal drug business on the phone and tells people he will only talk with them in person. Here's a call now with Charlie and Wildman. Charlie calls Wildman, tells him he's going to sneak out to Arizona on a plane. Explains he's going to fly in at 3.30 p.m. and stay for a day and a half. He wants to go to Tucson but has warrants for his arrest, so we'll have his friends come to the Phoenix area. Wildman responds to the information about the warrants and tells Charlie that he will help call. This is a lawyer that we have handled situations who will take care of the warrants. Charlie tells Wildman he needs to meet Sean because they need to talk about a bunch of stuff. So this is the police interpretation. Affiants believe Charlie is telling Peter that Wildman that he will be coming Arizona staying for a short duration to purchase illegal drugs. Charlie makes a point to stress to Peter that the trip will be of short duration. Tells Peter he needs to go to Tucson because of the warrants. Friends in come to Phoenix. The fact that the trip is of short duration would be consistent with the trip to purchase illegal drugs. Additionally, we believe that Charlie wants to discuss purchasing illegal drugs with Sean once he arrives in Phoenix. Then they put forward the reasons for getting a wiretap. Your affiants and other law enforcement agencies have been conducting extensive surveillance of the Atwood organization, including Sean. Although surveillance has been successful in identifying locations and vehicles, it has not led to the seizure of illegal drugs being distributed by the organization. That's because we could see these guys coming from a mile away. It has not identified the source of the supply how the organization operates, how it launders its money. Not yet, at least. Additionally, law enforcement officers experience difficulties in watching locations and gathering information relative to which locations are being used by the Atwood organization. As an example, surveillance officers noted that when attempting to follow Sean, he drives at a high rate of speed, making it dangerous for the police officers to maintain surveillance. Surveillance stationary moving poses a risk that Atwood and his associates will detect surveillance and be alerted and make them more wary and circumspect in their activities. We're aware from personal experience that stationary and moving surveillance have limitations. It is not unusual for those in illegal drug trafficking to avoid surveillance by erratic driving, changes of speed, Sudden turns. They had undercover cops following me and I was just losing them in my twin turbo Mazda RX-7 very easily until they put a sat to light tracking device in the car and then they got me. Um, this now is on the use of snitches as witnesses. So there are a total of 10 informants concerned citizens so the 10 people who got the case going were, was the first lot of informants. And then four people from my case agreed to testify. That was the four in, um, informants after our arrest. So there was 14 total informants, but a lot of them, the original ones, because the case went stale, they weren't going to be test doing any testifying. Five of these sources of information sought out law enforcement on their own initiative to provide information regarding the Atwood Enterprise. The other five were located by your affiants or fellow officers and interviewed regarding their past or current involvement with the Atwood Enterprise. Of the 10 listed, we believe most would not be willing to testify at a grand jury proceeding or trial because one and six are believed to be currently active in the Atwood Enterprise. In January of 2002, law enforcement observed one interacting with at least one individual subject to this investigation. 
So six has been in telephone contact with one individual who's the target. Because the ongoing investigation of your affiliates indicates one and six are currently involved. Using these so sources at grand jury would alert these sources to the investigation, jeopardize the investigation, compromise safety. The whereabouts of two, three, four, seven, and nine are unknown. Source two provided information in January 2001 under assumed name and date of birth. After learning the true identity of source two, we discovered there's an outstanding warrant for him or her. When source two was confronted with this information, they never, he never contacted law enforcement again, the whereabouts unknown. Three and nine attempted to cooperate, but failed to comply with their agreements. Both have warrants. Source four was provided under anonymity. We have no uh, uh, further information as their identity. Seven provided information pursuant to an agreement, but has not been in contact with law enforcement since. If called to testify, it would be historical. Seven did not acknowledge, have knowledge of the Atwood Enterprise structure. They completed their agreement. It would be stale information. They no longer associate with the Atwood Enterprise. As the information listed in the above, entitled information through confidential informants and concerned citizens indicates five, seven, and eight provided historical info. Neither, neither provide information or shown they have knowledge of the structure or enterprise. Five, seven, and eight do not even know that Sean exists or he's the head of the enterprise. So there's no reason to believe that they could introduce law enforcement to the enterprise. It's been, information has been useful, but not enough for prosecutions. Source 10 has provided historical information. She said that he or she is unwilling to introduce an undercover because she fears, he, she fears, his, her safety um, and is unwilling to testify. Beyond the information they have thus provided regarding the drug activities of the enterprise, none of the sources are aware of the complete volume of the illegal drug drugs sold, nor are they aware of all the distributors, nor do they know the complete distribution network. None of the sources have knowledge of money laundering. None have a complete inventory of the assets. Testimony will not lead to a viable prosecution. Could only compromise the safety. Given Sean's propensity for violence, I never got charged with any violent crimes. Like I said, I didn't have wild man beat them up. I had them move in with them if they owed me money. Your affiants have grave concerns for the sources being used as potential witnesses. And then this is titled Undercover Operations. The history of the drug activities of Sean indicate he uses a tight-knit extended family to facilitate drug-related crimes. Undercover ops have not been able to successfully infiltrate the drug business. Undercover ops, older guys from out of state, claiming to be out of state, trying to set up a drug deal. We've got no history from these people, never heard of them in our lives, suddenly appear from New York or Chicago. Come on, come up with something better than that. The likelihood of a successful undercover op is, is succeeding is minimal at best. Sources interviewed regarding this conspiracy have indicated use of undercover officer and informants would not be effective. According to source two, Sean does not deal in line level selling. It is your Affiant's belief that the arresting, arresting a person who sold illegal drugs supplied by Sean to an undercover officer would result in that person being cut off from the enterprise to insulate Sean. Based upon the backgrounds of co-conspirators, methods such as infiltration are too dangerous and highly unlikely to succeed. An example of this would be a statement made by Wild Woman after her arrest at 1103 South Farmer. She told your affiance that she was willing to cooperate. However, on being released from jail, she immediately fled to Mexico. <laughs> Furthermore, your affiance recently interviewed Source 10, asked if he, she would be willing to introduce an undercover. She said she refused to do so due, due to the dangerous nature reputation of Sean. In addition, knowledge about the drugs enterprise, its methods of operation, do not reveal how it launders its proceeds. Undercover operation will not reveal the full nature of the activities of the Atwood Enterprise. 
all very le- in, much in legalese, but you guys asked for some um, descriptions of my racketeering case, and there it is, straight from the words of the detectives. So, hope you've enjoyed this video. Cheers from London.